Hello, everybody. So here we are. This is the final lesson uh, of new material, certainly, for our higher chemistry course. So well done for getting this far with, uh, with the attitude that you have. Um, so what you're going to need today is your calculator, pen and a paper, unit two notes, which you can fill out and annotate as we go through or at the end, whichever is your preference, and also your data book. OK, so here's your prior knowledge questions. Let's get started. So for the last time, pause and uh, when you're ready, unpause and we'll go through the answers. All right, so to do this one, you need to be able to write the formula for copper 2 sulfate. So um, we uh, know that the copper has got a 2 plus charge and the sul uh, sorry, not sulfate, phosphate. The phosphate has got a PO43 negative charge. So once you balance it all out, uh, balance the charges all out, this is what the formula is. So if we have one mole of that chemical, how many moles of ions in total do we have? Well, if we count, we've got one, two, three moles of copper and one, two moles of phosphate. So three plus two is therefore five. So I know a couple of people find this a bit confusing. How can you have five moles of something if you only have one mole of something? Well, you can kind of think of this the way I think of it is like, like Lego block. OK, so that Lego block there, we have one of that structure. OK, so that's we, let's say that we have one mole, if you will, of that structure there. But how many moles in total of the individual things do we have? Well, we've got two moles of the blue. We've got well, sorry, we've got a yellow on top. So we'll call that two moles of the yellow, one mole of the green and one mole of the red. So in total in this here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six moles of individual blocks that make up one mole of the whole thing. So it's the exact same thing with these chemicals here. So hopefully that helps you a little bit. Next one. So next question here. So pause and then we'll go through the answer. OK, so for this one here, what have we got going on? We've got the mean bond enthalpy, so the average bond enthalpy for the carbon to fluorine bond is 484 kilojoules per mole, in which the process is below a, B, C or D is the enthalpy change approximately equal to four times that, 1,936 kilojoules per mole. OK, so let's have a look at what we've got. So in each of these here, we have the CF4 molecule. So this thing here, we've got in here, we have one, two, three and four carbon to fluorine bonds. And we know that according to this here, if you break one of them, it releases 400, oh, sorry, it requires 484 kilojoules uh, per mole. So you have to put energy into this to break that bond. So if you break four of these, how much is that going to, um, which of these is represents when you break four of them? So let's have a look at uh, this one first off. So CF4 to CF2. So what's going on here is we're actually making some new bonds. And we're also taking the carbon, which will let's say that we break this or we break uh, one mole of this, we'd have some carbon atoms floating around. They would be in the gaseous state and then they would change into the solid state. And this here is the, it represented in graphite. So when it goes from a solid to, sorry, when it goes from a, a gaseous state straight into a solid state, that's called deposition. So uh, this here requires energy as well. Sorry, it would release energy rather when these bonds are made. So this one here is incorrect because the total enthalpy change of all of this is not going to be equal to four times breaking of this. So A is out. And for that reason as well, C is out. So now we're left with B and we're left with D. So if you have a look at D, well, in D, you've got the same issue that you would start with a gaseous carbon, but then you end up with a solid carbon. And in other words, energy would be released when these bonds here are made or the bonds within the carbon molecule carbon compound is made. So therefore, the only one that would be left over is the CF4 here. And the carbon is in the gaseous state, so no bonds have been made here. So there's no entity change there. And all of these fluorine uh, are in the in single atoms. So there's no bonds being made here. So the total entropy change of all of this is just going to be the breaking of these bonds here. So B is the correct answer. Last one.
Okay, so Tollens, well, if you go back to last lesson or you check through your notes, you should have hopefully come across the fact that Tollens is to do with the reduction of silver plus ions. Ag plus ions gain an electron, uh, they are reduced and it forms the silver solid. And that silver solid is, um, or solid silver rather, is the thing that coats the mirror in the silver mirror test. Okay. Okay, so let's crack on. So. CFE higher skin care. So this is in two halves this lesson. And the first half, we're going to cover the following. State the effects of UV light on molecules, and then also state how sunblock prevents these effects. So I'm sure you remember from S1 and S2, or maybe you've done it in physics, that light is made up of lots of different wavelengths. But we can only see certain wavelengths. Our brains have evolved to only see some parts of light. But there are lots of other parts of light in there as well. And if you were to look and if you were to look at the full spectrum of light, it's called the electromagnetic spectrum, visible light is only actually a very small part of it. You have radio rays, uh, infrared radiation, ultraviolet X-rays, gamma rays, and so on and so on, and, and more. The one that we're interested in is the ultraviolet light. And ultraviolet light is a high energy part of light. And that high energy can cause us some problems because it can interact with the molecules in our skin. So I'm sure you're aware that if you are exposed to UV radiation for a high, uh, for a long period of time or at a very high intensity, you could be sunburnt, you could get aging of the skin. And this here is quite a famous picture, um, certainly in skincare circles, um, whereby this person was a trucker and this person worked for many, many years. And this side of their face, of this person's face, was facing the sun, was looking, uh, this must have been on the, on the driver's side, uh, they were, that's where the sun was coming in and the sun has aged this part of the skin significantly more than this side over here. So this has taken years and years to happen, but it's an example of how uh, exposure to sunlight can cause aging of the skin. And it can also cause more serious effects, if the others weren't serious enough, of skin cancer. And that if you are exposed to UV radiation, it could potentially cause skin cancer. So we need to be able to present, uh, prevent that from happening. And the way that we prevent it from happening is by using sunblock or sunscreen. And there are two methods for how these work. So just have a quick read of this, please. So the physical sunscreen is just like a block, really. It stops anything getting through. The chemical sunscreen uh, has chemicals within it, and then they will absorb or they will change those UV rays into safer forms of light. So that's a very brief overview of how sunscreens and sunblock work. The second part of this is all to do with free radicals and free radical reactions. So if you want to have a read of these, please. So the sort of question that you can be expected to answer this here is, can you define what is meant by a free radical? So that'll be one of the types of questions. Another type of question would be, which of those is not a step in a free radical chain reaction? And we've got four terms there, activation, initiation, propagation, and termination. So the three of those are relevant to what we're going to learn now. So you need to know what is a free radical and also what can you identify? Can you uh, figure out what are the steps in a free radical chain reaction? So how is DNA damaged? Well, there's two methods broadly. The first one is a direct method, whereby DNA absorbs UV light and this directly alters the DNA, it causes genetic mutations. The second would be that the UV light is absorbed by molecules in the skin, which then forms something called a free radical, and this free radical then reacts with the DNA and that damages it. So let's define a free radical. The free radical is a highly reactive species with an unpaired electron. And it's this unpaired electron that makes it very reactive because this chemical wants to either lose or to gain an extra electron so that it becomes unstable. So it's looking for something to react with. If it does react with the DNA, it can cause genetic mutations, which can then unfortunately or potentially lead to skin cancer. So we're gonna focus now on free radical chain reactions. How does this process happen? We're going to use the example of um, if we imagine we have a beaker of bromine and a hydrocarbon 
and we're going to add some UV light to that and we're going to see what happens. So here we go. So we started with a bromine molecule made up of two bromine atoms, Br2, and that bond is quite stable. But if we add a little bit of UV light to it, that bond will break and then we'll form two bromine uh, free radicals where each Br now has an unpaired electron. Now they're looking to become more stable. So one of the things that they could do is they could now react with themselves, but maybe they will come across something else nearby. They could come across this methane molecule here, CH4. And if they do that, the free radical can react with nearby molecules, and that is going to make new free radicals. So notice what has happened, and that this hydrogen here has dropped off. It has then reacted with the Br free radical, and it's formed HBr. But now we're left with this chemical here, this methyl free radical, with this unpaired electron. Our last step in our free radical chain reactions is that we could have two different or two similar or the same rather free radicals joining together and reacting together. So the two free radicals react together and form a stable molecule. And this molecule here is now stable because it is not a free radical. It doesn't have an unpaired electron. So we have names for these steps in this free radical chain reaction. The first one is initiation. Uh, whereby the free radicals are made. The second step is where that free radical then goes and reacts with another chemical and it causes a different free radical to be formed. We call that propagation. So it's making more and more and more free radicals. Our third step is known as termination. And in the termination reaction, we have two free radicals that react together to form a stable molecule. And that termination then marks the end of this chain reaction. Now, in my example here, I've given it where the reaction finishes with a CH3 Br molecule being formed. But that's not the only potential molecule that could be formed in this reaction vessel. If you have a think of the other free radicals that are in there, what else do you think could be formed? So one of the things that you could have formed is a CH3 CH3. You could have two CH3 free radicals reacting together to form C2H6, so that could form ethane, or you could have the Br free radicals reacting together, uh, and that would then form uh, Br2, and that would be around about it. So one of the ways that uh, chemists have got around or tried to prevent these free radicals is you add a free radical scavenger, which is essentially just an antioxidant. They're added to cosmetics, to anti-aging creams, and also to food packaging so that the food doesn't go off. So what happens with this here is that you have your antioxidant that will find this free radical or it will come across this free radical and it will give away its electron. This free radical here is now stable. It's gained electron. It doesn't want to react with anything else. So it isn't going to cause the things that we've gone over before. So that would be food going off, anti-aging, uh, genetic mutations and so on and so on. So let's have a go at some past paper questions. State what is meant by the term free radical. Okay, so free radical is a species or a chemical which has got an unpaired uh, electron, which makes it highly reactive. So what's the name of this step here? You have three choices. You could have initiation, propagation or termination. So in this example here, we've already got a free radical to start with. So it can't be initiation. It can't be at the beginning of this, the, where it's initiated. What happens here, though, is that it's forming a new free radical or a different free radical. So this, therefore, is known as propagation. So the question here is, which of the following is a propagation step in this reaction? So propagation is where you make a new free radical. If you have a look at the first one, A, that's an example of initiation because you start with uh, no free radicals and now you make two. 
B is termination, because you're adding two free radicals together to get this chemical here, which is stable. C is also termination, whereas in D, you have a free radical that reacts with a stable chemical. It forms a new stable chemical, but then you're left with a different free radical. So therefore, D is propagation. And this is a particularly tough question. This is from the old advanced higher. So take your time on this one. You're looking to identify T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z. All right, so T, hopefully you got this one here. Basically what's going on in this question here is that whatever is produced here is going to be in the next step. So we have the BR2 that's split up into two BR free radicals. That BR free radical is now T and it's going to react with C2H6. So this C2H6 now has, so this is initiation, the first one. Uh, this is propagation because we formed a new and different free radical. But what's left over? Well, we had the BR free radical. We've taken away a H, therefore HBR is going to be left over. In the next one, we have Br2 and we form C2H5Br. Well, the only place that this can, the C2H5 can come from must be V, which is this chemical here. So this chemical goes into here. So V is therefore C2H5. And it, it's important we note that it is a free radical as well. In this one here, W, what's going to be left over? Well, if you would used one of the Brs here that was found in this bromine molecule, that has to be left over, the Br free radical. So these two Br free radicals, so we've now got two free radicals reacting together. This is therefore a termination step. So that's going to be a Br2. We've got two of these free radicals reacting together, another termination step. So we add them together, C2, uh, sorry, C4H10. And then last but not least, we have C2H5 free radical plus something else and forms this. Well, it must be Br free radical. So that's us, that's the end of higher chemistry. So if you want to have a quick read of these success criteria, so we stated what is meant by a free radical. We described how they're formed and their effects in the body. We stated the three steps, initiation, propagation, and termination. And then we have also explained the role of free radical scavengers in preventing skin aging and food going off. And there we go. So if you guys can get some questions to me, if you have any, and if you want to uh, complete the Google form as quickly as possible, and well done. Okay, bye for now.